on the last night, I, I don't have many old clothes, particularly in a convention like this, namely because I try to impart uh, to you when I'm ministering, and I focus on channeling that that way. But on the last night, I want us to come and make some, if you wish, want to make some form of commitment, and we kind of believe God to seal something into your lives. Is that okay? And uh, just just to believe for that. Amen. An impartation. Praise God. A commitment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, last year, I remember towards the end of the... Yeah, last year sometime, I got a little track. I didn't even know what day it is. Um, yeah. I was in Moravian Falls. And, um, you know, many of you know, there's a kind of an open heaven in that whole area. And... Uh, I went to bed one night, went to sleep, and woke up. I don't know what time, maybe two in the morning, something like that. And the room started to get lighter. And I mean, we were way really up in the mountain and no outside lights. There was no moonlight. And I thought, uh-oh, here we go. So I sat up in bed, and there was an angel at the end of my bed, very tall angel. And kind of, you know, there are angels and there are angels. There are angels who can be kind of really friendly and you can joke with them. And there are angels which you can't, too. You can't, they just don't crack a smile, you know. They're just so focused. And so this angel stood on the end of my bed and I thought I'm going to be careful with this angel. Very tall, maybe nine feet, ten feet tall. And... um even taller, but I looked at this angel, and this angel, I hadn't seen anything like this before, he was covered in precious stones, like diamonds, like rubies, jewels, stones, and I thought, wow, he's just covered in them, and uh, I looked at this angel, and I thought, i let him break the ice, I'm not going to ask who he is, or so we sat there kind of eyeing each other off for a while, you know. Tremendous presence of the Lord filling the room. And he said, uh, I am an angel of destiny. And I thought, I've been released into the earth at this time to begin to awaken destiny in this generation. Massive angel and he was covered in um, diamonds, stones like I'd never seen before, precious stones. And he said, um, for the last few months or so, I have been releasing these stones in the United States of America and other parts of the world. And he said, uh, these stones represent people's destinies. Now, because I'd been out of the United States for quite a while, I didn't realize, I didn't know that people have been finding precious stones and wake up in the morning and stones were on the dresser or somewhere like that. He said, I've wrote, I, I have been doing that as a sign that I am in your midst. Destiny. He talked about the destiny of North America and the purposes of God. We need to realize that this, this angel is now in the earth, particularly in this continent, releasing destiny. Awakening was the word that he used, awakening destiny. And I believe that during this time together, that real sense of destiny is going to be awakened in people. Some people can be confused, they don't know why I'm here and so on. You just believe God's going to awaken within you a realization of why you are here, so that you can begin to streamline your life to that and begin, you know, to work into it. The angel of destiny. This is a generation of destiny. And we are sons and daughters of destiny in this generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, 
He shall receive the blessing of the Lord and the righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek your face. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, to everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? What's the hill of the Lord? It goes on to say, he that hath clean hands, pure heart. This is for a generation, a specific generation. This is for a generation that will really seek the Lord and seek his face. This was written for this generation. There is a generation that will finally ascend the hill of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's you. I mean, there's no other generation after you. God will be this one. You're it. There's going to be a people who will climb, who will ascend the hill of the Lord. Mount Zion, the hill of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. We need to look at the significance of this. You know, Mount Zion was a place where David put the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? A very unusual kind of situation because... You know, it broke all the protocol. No one could get in to where the ark was except the high priest on one day of the year. The ordinary people like you and me could never get in to where that ark was. You know, they nobody got in there. Um, you know, but God just gave us a prophetic interlude for a short period of time before Solomon built his temple and it was put back into the temple. There was a short interlude there whereby that Ark of the Covenant was seen by everyone and the glory shone. Actually, Mount Zion was like a huge lighthouse on the top of Mount Zion. And from the Ark of the Covenant, it shone right around the whole of the Jerusalem. You know, the, by the scriptures, like out of Zion, God is shining. And David talks about this, this uh, much about Zion. Um, the problem was that the, the Philistines came in and invaded Israel and took the ark. Now, this was a disaster because the ark represented the presence of God, the glory of God, resident there in the ark. And, you know, Eli the priest, when he heard the, the news of all this, fell off his chair and broke his neck. You know, and uh, his daughter in law said, Ichabod, Ach Ichabod, that glory has departed. And so there was this period of time where the presence and glory of God left Israel. It was just not there anymore. You know, it's interesting. They continued on with all of their sacrifices, they continued on with all of their temple worship, they continued on with all of the ritual, but God wasn't there. How easy it is to do that. We continue on with, but the presence is not there. You know, religion can keep going forever on its own. It doesn't need the presence of God. It needs a set of rules. It doesn't need the presence of God. They kept on doing everything that all was done. Just kept on going as if nothing had happened. But the glory of God had departed. The Philistines, you know, 1 Samuel 5, 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into their spirit house and they, uh, or into their temple, the house of Dagon, and set it by Dagon. Now, Dagon was a deity in which they worshipped. It was their main god. And they set it in the temple. They brought the ark of the covenant, set it next to us, just another trophy, another spirit thing. They put it by this god, Dagon. And, um, and when the day of Ashdod arose early next day in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the earth before the, the ark of the Lord. And so they took Dagon again and set him in his place. Now, Dagon was just a carving, you know, it was just probably a stone carving or whatever of their God. So it was a bit disconcerting to them. So... They put it, stood him up again next to the ark. 
And uh, when they arose early the next morning, 1 Samuel 5, 4, it said Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground again. And his head had broken off. And his hands had broken off. And only the stump was left. Now, these Philistines got to think about, what is it with this box here? This gold-covered box with the over above them? Carved angels in gold at the mercy seat. They thought, what, what is this? And then all kinds of plagues began to break out among the Philistines. You know, it's, this, this, this ark was dangerous because it carried a high level of the manifest presence of God. And as soon as they put it in their spirit house or their temple, all the false gods began to be affected. <laughs> Where is that ark now? I mean, Indiana Jones has been looking for it for ages, you know. <laughs> he ain't going to find it because it's in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You just got to get the veil worn. And so, you know, this thing was dangerous, really dangerous. And so they decided they're going to get rid of this ark and send it back to Israel. So they build a cart. They put the ark on the cart. They get a cow with, with a, uh, its calf. And they said, we're not going to drive this thing. It'll go back on its own. So it sets off on its own, carrying the ark of presence of God. And so heading back, you know, to Israel, and it just ended, but it crossed into the borders of Israel. It says in 1 Samuel 6 and verse 13, and the people of Beth Hemish were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw the ark coming back. This is a strange thing. No one with it but a cow, you know, pulling the ark. And they thought, well, you know, this ark is returning. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beshemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And so the men came and they, they took the, the cart, cut it in pieces, and uh, they took the cow and offered it as a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with them and the jewels and gold and put them on a great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifice the same day unto the Lord. Okay. But, so he did, comes back. They cut up the cart, make it into a fire, burn the offering. They're rejoicing because the ark has returned. And then somebody gets it into their brain. You know, there's always somebody. He opened the lid. Bad thing to do. There was a great flash. And 50,000 people were dead. That's what the Bible tells us. And it says, And, and he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten people. Oops, you don't do that. So they start to get a really healthy respect for this ark. You know? So what do they do with it? So they took this ark. It's, I didn't know what to do with it, but there's a guy who had a nice large house on the edge of town. And so they took the ark and put it in his house. I mean, that made everyone nervous, you know, in the house. But... Put it there. And it was there for 20 years because they couldn't figure out what to do with it and how to get it back. The Bible tells that. 20 years in this guy's house, you know. And after a while, David, you know, the, another generation comes. David comes in, king, and begins to think, how are we going to get this ark back? You know, we've got to work this, figure this thing out. All right. Uh, how many of you know nobody in that house touched the ark? <laughs> but David's thinking, how do we get the ark back? 
And so they got a new cart, you know, put it on the cart. Bad thing to do. It's already been on one cart. They make the journey starting back to Jerusalem, okay? Now, they come to a place, it says, and when they came under the threshing floor, First Chronicles 13, 9, they came under the threshing floor of Chidon, and the ark started to get a bit wobbly, and this guy puts out his hand to steady the ark. He's dead. David said, not again. What are we going to do with this thing? You know, just one flash and the guy was ash, just gone. This is a real difficult situation for them. What are they going to do with this ark? Now, when we go through all of this, remember where the ark is now. It's on the inside of you. What we got to do is get the lid off. That's all. Coming, this generation's going to lift the lid. Hallelujah. Oh, I tell you, I tell you. David was afraid that day in First Chronicles 13, 12. He said, and David was afraid of God that day, saying, how shall I bring the ark of God back to me? He had no clue what to do now. He got 50,000 dead, another one dead, and, you know, Everybody's giving it a wide berth. It's a dangerous thing to have in the land. You know, and, and it's like the manifest presence of God. You can't walk into the manifest presence of God unless you are redeemed and clean. And uh, this was the problem. One guy touches the ark and he's dead. He's wobbling. You think, well, is that fair? You know, we never see God, things from God's point of view, you see. This is, this, is, this is the problem. You know, God doesn't look so much as to what we do. He looks at why we do it. That's why God judged some people for the same sin and didn't judge other people. You think, what, what's going on here? Because God looks down at a deeper level. He looks at why you do it. Not so much as what you did. He looks at the intent of the heart. It goes a lot, lot deeper. We look at people and what they do and judge them. God doesn't do that. He looks at why they are like that, why they did that. There may be mitigating circumstances. God takes everything into account. No, we don't know why this guy is trying to do the, the favor, you know, but he does. So David was afraid of God that day, saying, how shall we bring back the ark? So he decided again to put the ark in some poor guy's house on the edge of town. You know, I bet everyone had their doors shut, you know, getting into my house, you know. <laughs> and so he goes, it's in this house for three months. So he consults with the prophets and the priests and the leaders, and, and uh, they find out that nobody ought to carry the ark but the Levites. And it's not to go on a cart. It's to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. Okay. And these Levites were first to go through a ritual cleansing to bring them into a place where they were safe to carry the ark. They were bathed, bathed had to be bathed in oil, had to bring a sin offering, a special offering for consecrations. Two things, I had to bring a sin offering, a consecration offering. It was a picture of the necess necessity of having a clean heart when we handle things of God. You see, a pure heart. And uh, like we said the other night, you know, the prophet Isaiah, we think, well, we're clean. We think, you know, we're fine. The prophet Isaiah was a good man, a prophet. We said this the other day. He got into the presence of the Lord and his whole life was bare. He thought, Man, I'm not much different to these people out there. That's coming again. Do you want that? Are you sure? Are <laughs> you really sure? <laughs> it's going to happen to us all. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you if we want to go on. A 
manifest presence of God will reveal really who we are. And we'll say, God, I am undone. But that has to come. Before we can carry what God is having for once for this generation to carry, there has to come fire. There has to come another level of cleansing. And we have to be open for that. We've got to kind of bury our pride, you know. Nobody's perfect. Okay, God wants to take us to another level, so there's an, another level of cleansing. Okay? That's how it works. As we go further and higher in God. You see, the blood deals with sin, right? You know, in the, in the charismatic move or the Jesus move, we had hundreds of people saved. Thousands, actually. In my church, most of them were hippies. And they were loaded with demons. I mean, just loaded. <laughs> they had been into everything. Uh, we are... <laughs> some of them were living... Well, some of the guys were living with three women. It was like, oh, you know, make love, not war. You know that era? What we need is love. Da, 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 da. Well, they got it the wrong way, you know. And so that was the kind of world we had back then in the late 60s and early 70s. Don't get saved and come into your church. You think, uh-oh, getting them saved is one thing, but now we've got a 1,000 people full of demons in my church. Seriously. Oh, and I had trouble with my denomination. They were going to throw me out because I was praying for Christians who had demons. Don't look at me like that. You can have a demon. Oh, I've gone quiet in here. <laughs> look, when you're born again, your spirit is clean, but in your soul is not clean. Your mind, your emotions, and will, anything can lodge in there. Right? And so we used to have deliverance sessions, a hundred at a time, three nights a week. I mean, they were wild times. <laughs> we struggled to get these people free. And we did eventually get them free from all kinds of stuff. And, you know, these people, the beauty of these people were that, like, they didn't know anything about church. They didn't know anything about the Bible, and you could tell them anything, and they believe it. That's a good thing. That's a bad thing. <laughs> you know, they didn't come from a background of different denominations with all kinds of mindsets. And they wanted to go on with God. We, and we had to be frank and honest and, and absolutely straight with these kids, you know? It's like they come into the kingdom of God. Okay, you've got these demons. We've got to get them out of you. I had no calm with, no problem with that. Okay, let's get them out. Okay. <laughs> I remember I was preaching away. On the front row were about 15 girls, you know. Just come in, just. And it was the days of the mini skirts, you know. All sitting on the front row with skirts up to their thighs, you know. And I've got to preach. And they're all on the front row. <laughs> I don't know. So I said, right, after the service, I want all you girls in my office. All right? <laughs> we get them into my office. And I said, now we've got a problem. I thought, how do we deal with this? Well, I said, first of all, I want to tell you how a man ticks. All right? Don't look at me like that. You're the same. <laughs> Come on, don't be religious on me. <laughs> Crying out loud. Yeah. I said, look, you, you've got skirts up to your thigh. I'm looking at you and trying to preach. I've got a problem. And you are causing it. And they said, oh, we didn't know. We didn't want to hurt you. We didn't want to know. I said, look, this is how it works. This is how seduction works. This is how this whole thing goes down. All right? Next service. They were covered from head to head. <laughs> 
I said, you don't have to go to that extreme. <laughs> they were open to everything. We had to teach them from square one. You can't just tell this generation something is wrong. You've got to tell them why it's wrong. And you've got to be honest and open with them. We had all of these problems. I think, you know, demons. You know, with this generation, it's a little different. The way people, the young people are becoming demonized in this generation, you know how most of the way it is through video games? Because what you focus on, you connect with. You're watching the violence and all of this stuff. Your mind is open. And if you're a Christian, your mind, those demons will inhabit your mind. I don't care if you're spirit filled or not. You open the door, they will come in. It's an absolute point of the enemy. You got to be real careful with this. Okay. Okay. So we get the harvest comes in. Now, this next thing is going to be a much bigger harvest. Churches are going to be filled with demon-possessed people who have just come into the kingdom of God. What are you going to do with them? How are you going to handle that? Are we going to have the time to handle that? This time. You see, the problem with the charismatic move, they had a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Something was missing. This generation is going to have salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the baptism of fire. I can tell you, demons hate the fire. If you get a person baptized on the Holy Ghost and fire, there are no demons left. See, this is what happened in the early church. People say, well, why didn't they have this problem in the early church? Because they had the fire. Hallelujah. Oh, these priests had to be sanctified to carry the things of God. Oh, see, the blood deals with sin, the fire deals with demons, and it deals with the residue that's been left in our life for a lifetime of sin, the hurts. All the stuff that's been left behind. It's not sin, but it's been the hurt, the damage that the sin has done within our lives requires the fire and the memories have got to be erased. Only the fire can do that. They had to sanctify themselves to carry the ark. See, God's going to do this in one hit in this next generation. And they'll be able to carry the ark, the presence of God, wherever they go. The seraphims are coming. The Lord spoke to me while I was in heaven and showed me these awesome creatures. Nothing like human form. Awesome creatures before the throne of God. Looking everywhere. He said, I'm going to send them into the earth. I'm going to send them into my church. We just need one in our midst. And none of you will be the same again. None of you. The fire of God will come. They have the ability. I saw, I only saw this once in the service. But it was a, just a picture of what was coming. One of these beings came into the service. Awesome presence of God. And as I watched, out of these beings went arrows of fire. I just watched. The beings stood in the front. And the people in the congregation, <laughs> nobody prayed for them. And in the end, it was like, through the congregation. These were arrows of fire. And I talked to these people afterwards. I said, what happened to you? He said, something hit me and I caught fire on the inside. The Lord spoke to me. He said, I'll let you see this. I let this happen once in your church. But it's grapes for the promised land. You've got to go in and get it. You've got to go in and get that. That's in the promised land. You're not there yet. I'll let you see it and taste it. See what I'm saying? We're entering the promised land. Oh, hallelujah. 
Oh, glory to God. See the blood deals? Sin, fire deals with demons. Hurts, the deep regrets, and deep damage is done. Requires the fire of God. Myriads of people with split personalities and all of that. The integration of that's going to require, and it's going to be taking place instantly with the fire of God. Oh, I tell you. Hallelujah. I am tired of struggling with people with multiple personalities. Usually being through sexual abuse. It takes too long. We specialized counseling to do that. We haven't got time for it. God's got the answer. Hallelujah. Oh, we have no idea what's coming. <laughs> God's going to take a whole demonized generation and clean them up. Just like that. Put them into the army of the Lord. Send them across the face of the earth. Hallelujah. Some of you are reacting now. On the inside, I can feel it. There are demons which are stirring. It's okay. Just hate them. The fire is coming. Okay? If you're feeling really uncomfortable, so I can feel it, you know? Some of you are particularly feeling really uncomfortable when I talk about this. That's okay. That's okay. You're getting scared, okay? Not you, they are. Hallelujah. Fire deals with them. Glory to God. They had to sanctify themselves to carry the presence of God. Yeah, you know, we don't hear that word much anymore, sanctify. It's like, you know, it needs to be, it's a Hebrew word in Hebrew, kadash or kodash. It means to make, make clean, set yourself apart and to be made clean. And uh, it's a picture, you know, consecration. God requires consecration. If each time we go to a new level, God requires a consecration for that. It's not just one consecration in our lives. He requires another consecration to take us to the next level. And it's a process. And they had to consecrate themselves, to, you know, to carry the ark. And that word consecrate in the Hebrew means to fill with. Fill with who? Fill with God. Fill with. In Ezra, sorry, Exodus 32, 29, it says, For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves unto the Lord. You are to carry, you see, the ark. Second Chronicles 29, 31 says, Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now that you have consecrated yourselves or filled yourselves with God, come near and bring offerings and thank offerings unto the Lord. Now that you filled yourself with God, Consecrated yourself to the Lord, set apart exclusively for his use. God's going to have a generation set apart exclusively, you see, for his use. Set apart to be made holy and uh, clean, pure. We shall ascend the hill of the Lord. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Purity of heart has to deal with motives. Not acts of sin. It has to deal with motives. Why we do things. He wants to get into a deeper level in our hearts and in our lives. You know, why, why are some people the way they are? And others are not. And we judge them. But God looks further back in their lives to see what has happened to them. We must never judge. We're not capable of seeing things how God sees them. We can't judge. He said, judge not. You don't know what's happened to that person, why they are like that. You see? He looks at it in a whole different way. A whole different way. I had an experience, you know, which ch changed my life because I was brought up in a Pentecostal church, Assembly of God church initially, and we had us certain things and the way things went. And one day I was preaching absolute truth what I'm telling you now and I saw the Lord standing at the back of the auditorium where about 4,000 people in the church and he was standing way at the back and I thought oh he's listening to me preach you know <laughs> oh man there's nothing worse put you off than that and uh, you see, 
he's standing there just looking. And then he started to walk down like this. That was so purposeful. And I just watched this. And the people wondered why I'd stopped preaching. And uh, walked down the stage like this, walked up the platform, walked straight into me, and then turned around on the inside of me, started looking at through my eyes. I saw everything differently. Everything. My judgment of things have been so far off. I understood why. He said, judge not lest you be judged. That totally changed my life. Totally changed the way I looked at things. I became totally animated. And it was no longer me. It was the Lord. My whole, the people looked at me and said, that's not you. Afterwards, that was not you. Because they know how I was. I'm their pastor and they know how I act. And, but I became totally different. You know, and they were kind of, kind of wide-eyed looking at me. <laughs> Christ in you. The hope of glory. Let me put this another way. Christ in you is the hope of this world. I'm going to preach on that tomorrow. But I want to tell you, or tonight, somewhere, <laughs> when it comes, Christ in us. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And we know that, we understand that. But in a few verses later, he said, you are the light of the world. What? Jesus is coming. Everybody believe that. Well, I want to tell you something. He's first going to come in you before he comes. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. The only hope of this world is Christ in you. You are an extension, you see, of him. Clean hands, a pure heart. So David said, now, okay, you guys, you've sanctified yourselves, you're filled with God, you can carry the ark. And they all said to David, are you really sure about this? He said, no, 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 oh, no, I, I, I've read the scripture. We've done it right. These poor priests, you know, thinking, yeah. Got in the back of their mind, 50,000 dead people. <laughs> yeah, what? They started carrying the ark on their shoulders. David thought about this and he said, okay, we won't take any chances here. And uh, how are we going to do this? They carry it. We're on the way to Mount Zion. We've got to put the ark on Mount Zion. You know? He said, we've done it right. I'm sure we've done this thing right. We've sanctified the people. You know, Paul said in Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, present yourselves as a living sacrifice, which is your acceptable service to me. And he was looking back to these sacrifices. He said, now, we in the New Testament... You present yourself. You become a sacrifice. Give yourself totally to God. You know? Give up your life. I remember reading, how many of you read that, the, that vision or account of that Rick Joyner had about the church on the island? Remember that? Have you read that? He saw the church on, the, on an island, okay? And they're all fighting among themselves. So there was an internal war going on. All fighting among themselves. So... And, on, and the harvest were on, there were ships out there, but couldn't come onto the, onto the island because the church was fighting among themselves. And he saw, and you know what that is? The Lord said, I'm not going to let the new people come in while the church is fighting themselves because they'll become just like well, who they are in the church. You got to realize, you know, because you're going to be discipling hundreds of people. You know, pastors can't do this. Only one person. You gotta have to do it. You have a group, maybe 20, 30, 40 people in your house two or three times a week. You gotta constantly go disciple them. But the problem is the disciple comes becomes like their master. They're gonna turn out just like you. Now, isn't that a scary thought? <laughs> no wonder he was not gonna let them onto the island, into the church. And then the waves came across. Finally, a number of waves came across the church until the, the church was reduced and it was clean and pure. And 
the light of the glory of God back in the church. And then the Lord said, now I can let the people go. The ship started coming to the island. People got out of the boats and started to get into the church. And first thing was first. They all met the Lord. The Lord took hold of them one by one and said, are you willing to die for me? That's not the kind of question we ask new converts, is it? Maybe we got it wrong. You know? Get them in and shoot them before they backslide. Get them straight to heaven. <laughs> yeah. It's one way. Anyway, he said, will you die for me? He said, yes. He took his sword and pushed it right through their heart. And they died. Put in the cemetery. Next one. He said, some of them died real slow. Struggled. They want to die. So we joined and thought, well, I'm determined not to die slowly. <laughs> so he came across the week time and said, you prepared to die for me? And he said, yes. He took out his sword. He said, Chow! it was just this initial pain. And then everything went black. He woke up in the cemetery. Hallelujah. You know, there's nothing like resurrections for messing up cemeteries. Some of our churches are cemeteries, you know. He said they came to. And he said they walk in such a presence of God, such a realm of the Spirit. He said some refused to die. He said, no, no I'm not going to die. But he still let them on the island. But they didn't come to that level of stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, one day the Lord came to me and he said, Neville, change your message. I said, what? He said, change your message. He said, you've got to give this generation something to die for. There's all kinds of causes out there people will die for. To give them something to die for and give them a new day that's coming. That's what this generation needs. We can't put your foot about with this. People coming into the kingdom of God, it's to give their all. We've got to be willing to die. Many of them will be martyred. Literally. That's okay. That's a good death. Instant glory. But I won't tell you, give them something to die for. God wants their lives. There's a new world coming and it's worth dying for. One of my, my daughter's, one of my most favorite songs before the Lord took her was a, a, a secular song. Don't tell me it's not worth dying for. Don't tell me it's not worth trying for. Everything I do, I do it for you. See? It's worth dying for. It's worth it. This generation will be willing to die for it if necessary. Because they know. It's just a little while and resurrection comes. And there's a whole new world. They give their life for a whole world. You know? You know, the whole movements in the earth, you know, like save the world. Well, I believe in saving the world, but the same, this, the same people will abort their children. Save the worlds and kill the children. You know how skewed up that is? There's a real movement coming to save this world. Hallelujah. Oh, don't get me on that. Okay. You were born for this time. Psalm 102.13. Now shalt arise and have mercy on Zion. You see, David got the ark. Finally, every, it's very interesting. It says every so many paces, they stopped, killed an animal. It, was, it worked out about every 18 feet. That's not far, you know. There's a long way to go. Keep the carry in the ark, you poor guys. Every 18 feet down the road on the mountain side, they stopped. They killed an animal. You know how long that takes? Cut it up. 
burn it, have a worship service, then go another 18 feet. We work out how long that took. David wasn't going to take any chances with this thing. I can tell you. You know, it was like death by a thousand cuts. They were going to get there. Each time they lay down their lives. I have another consecration. They lay down their lives. You can imagine 50,000 of people that just died. Finally get the design. And David thinks, now, in the tabernacle, they had the curtains, they had all of this stuff. This thing has to be covered. It's dangerous. God said, no, stick it in a tent with no door on it. It's, what? Right on top of Mount Zion, for a period of time, God shined from Zion. All from Jerusalem. It was like a lighthouse. You look at the scriptures that David wrote about that in the Psalms about Zion. Out of Zion, God has shined. It's just a prophetic interlude. Now, Mount Zion is in here. Come on now. And out of Zion, God wants to shine. The glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. It's in here. Just needs the cap taken off. Just needs another dose of fire and cleansing. The cap. The glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you, and the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto you. That's where we are. God's had enough where the church is right now. And we've got to be honest. I mean, even as preachers, we've got to be honest. We don't have what it takes right now. We got, what we've got is good. You know, I'm not denying. I'm not, it's good, and let's keep doing it. It's wonderful. We get people saved. But we're just touching the surface. There's a whole world out there. We've got to come up to another level. Once this happens, I tell you, we will not be able to stop the harvest coming in. No matter what you preach or you don't preach, they'll still come because it will be presence orientated. The message will be us, the presence of God coming from us, not so much of what we say. And the harvest will flock in. The church will fill up. You'll have to go outdoors in the outdoor stadiums. I tell you, it's coming. It's on the way. It started to be initiated. Hallelujah. You see, you know, the things have started, particularly here in America, and it started. You've seen some of this, this stuff started. It's not perfect. Don't judge what you don't understand. Don't judge. This, your mindset cannot judge things. You say, oh, according to Scripture, blah, blah, religion. God's doing a new thing, something you haven't seen before, and you haven't the ability to judge it. Judge it by the fruit. God can pick up anyone who needs to be picked up. I tell you. We look at the externals. Don't judge that which you don't understand. You judge, you will be judged. That's what the Bible says. This thing is going to increase and increase and increase. And it's self-purifying. And this revival has many aspects to it. Some are signs and wonders. Some will have holiness. Some will have the... And they're all combined in the end. They won't all have these elements together at the beginning. They'll be different. We say, well, that's different from this. That's the real thing. No, it's part of the whole. It'll all come together. And it will be self-purifying. Give it time. It's just in the infancy. And some of the old is still coming over into it. That's all right. It's better than what we had before. Come on. It's on the way. So don't judge. You're not capable of it. I really mean that. You are not capable of it. Lord, I have judged some people from the externals. 
And God had to really deal with me. He said, you do not know what that person has been through. You don't. One time he was real strong with me. He appeared to me and said, when it comes to dealing with this, just keep your mouth shut. And I said, okay, I'm not capable of judging. Unless you see with the eyes of the Lord. Identify yourself by judging. Rise and shine. Hallelujah. Thou shalt have mercy on Zion. For the time to favor her has come. You see? When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear, he says, in his glory. Hallelujah. The early church had a little of David's tabernacle. Because they said, this is that which the prophet spoke of in the tabernacle of David. And he referred it to Pentecost in the early church. Pentecost only had the deposit. They didn't have the fullness. The early rain, God said, I'll give you the early rain and the latter rain in one month. The early church had the early rain. You know, meteorologists tell us in Israel, the early rain comes, softens the ground, plant the seed. The latter rain, then the dry period, and then the latter rain comes, and the latter rain is seven times greater than the former rain, literally in Israel. What the early church had was good. What we are getting is seven times greater, and it ripens the harvest. You know, ooh, you know, Peter shared up, walked down the street, people were healed. Good, we're going to see that. That'll become common. But I want to tell you something. There's going to be, in, in, in cities, there's going to be areas where whole city blocks are going to have a cordon around them, a spirit cordon. It's like a, a fence in the spirit around them. Anybody walking into that will be saved. Whole city blocks. I've seen it. God took me forward into this to see this. Newspapers, the, the news couldn't work out what was going on. Whole city blocks. Anybody who got caught in that city block came under the spirit of the fear of the Lord and cried out, what must I do to be saved? God can bring this harvest in. The problem is, can we cope with it? You know? Oh, hallelujah. Seven times greater than what the early church had. It said, the Lord... He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise them. How many people in Israel were destitute? They're crying out, not necessarily to God, but they're crying out for something, they're trying to fill their lives with meaning and purpose. God hears their cries. He said, he heard the cry of the destitute. He said, this shall be written for a generation to come. That's this generation. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Because God has looked down from heaven and looked down from his sanctuary and beheld the earth. And he heard the groaning of the prisoners. That's this present world in which we live in. He heard the groaning of the prisoners. And he was determined to loose those who are appointed unto death and to declare the name of the Lord in Zion. God's concerned about this generation. He's concerned about what's going on in the world today. Seven billion people. Seven billion people approaching seven billion people. In a time with the greatest population on the face of the earth, God looks down from heaven. And he says, it's time. We're going to get them. I tell you, that's his strategy. That's why he's waiting. Population comes up. Population comes up. Now, guys, he said, the world is full of people. Let's reap the harvest. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're alive in this day? I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, the harvest. So David put the ark on my sign. Hallelujah. 
you're going to be sons and daughters of Zion. Special generation. Glory to God. Everyone has looked forward. Even the prophets look forward to this generation. Even it was said about Jesus, a generation shall serve him. We talk about one generation. This generation. Isaiah said that. A generation shall serve him. And he said, he shall see his seed. He shall see his replica in us. And that generation shall serve him. Hallelujah. Clean hands and a pure heart. Who shall ascend this hill of the Lord? God's coming. It's going to be a purifying work. He's kicking it off possibly with signs and wonders. And that's good. But other elements will be joined into that. That signs and wonders will begin to develop a sense of the fear of the Lord. The fire of the Lord will come. Cleanse his church like never before and take us to the next level. See, the things in our life, you're only responsible for in your life what God is revealing to you. We walk in the light. But when the further light comes, we see things that, which we never thought were there, right? We weren't responsible for them before. But now further light comes, we become responsible because we see things in our life we never saw before. We say, oh God, cleanse me, let the fire, and it takes us to the next level. You're only responsible for what you see, what God reveals, what he, he convicts you of, you know. Oh, clean hands and a pure heart. In Micah chapter 4, it says, And thou, O daughter of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto you it's going to come, even the first dominion. What does that mean? He said, when I bring you to Zion, something's going to come to you. The first dominion. What was the first dominion? It was the dominion that God gave to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Dominion over everything in this planet. Those who come to Zion are going to receive an authority which we've never dreamed of. But it cannot be given to us in first as a cleansing. Otherwise we will misuse it. He said, unto you it's going to come the first dominion. The dominion that Adam had in the Garden of Eden is going to be restored back to the church. Over the whole of the animal creation whole creation, over every virus, over every germ, everything that's in this world will be given dominion over it. Hallelujah. And in the process, we'll be immune to all of that. Remember John G. Lake? How many have read John G. Lake? Okay, great plague in South Africa. People are dying with this plague all over the place. And um, he came in to help in, in, in the hospitals to help and said, you can't come in here. You haven't had an inoculation. You can't do this. He said, don't worry about it. He said, no, you can't come here. There's a guy vomiting with foam on his mouth, dying over there. He goes over and he picks up the stuff in his hand. And he said, put it under the microscope. He waits. They stick it under the microscope. Every virus in there is dead. The law of the spirit of life made him free from the law of sin and death. So that's an immunity. See, what was coming out of him killed everything. That was a game deal. Every disease, every sick. You see, you really are what you, what you are generating all of the time. In the realm of the spirit, you are generating. There's a light around you. You're generating color. You're generating sound. And you're generating smell. How do you smell today? Who you are. Every emotion has a sound, has a smell, has a color. Demons can pick it up for miles if it's negative. Demons can pick up fear. That smell of fear. That vibration of fear that comes out. They pick it up for miles and flock to you. You don't stop generating. In the realm of the spirit, if you could see what comes out of you. See, when someone comes out who's angry, you wouldn't believe what comes out of them. People with self-pity emanate such a dark, dingy color and a terrible smell. 
and a terrible sound which attracts the whole thing gets worse and worse. No, I'm not crazy. I see this in the spirit. You can't stop generating out who you are. <laughs> Isn't that frightening for? <laughs> oh, glory. Yeah. And to you it shall come the first dominion. The dominion that Adam had. It says in Obadiah 1, 17, out of Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. Oh, that's this generation. That's this generation. Obadiah 1, 21 tells us, and saviors shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall become the Lord's. It didn't say a savior. It said saviors, sons of God, daughters of God, shall come forth from this place in Zion. Saviors. Not the savior. There's only one sacrifice. You know where I'm coming from. Deliverers, saviors. Christ in us, the hope of this world. Oh, hallelujah. People who come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Quickly, Psalm 2, 6. You have set my king upon his holy hill in Zion, and I will declare and decree, the Lord has said unto me, you are my son now. You are my son. I'm on Zion. This day, when we church comes to Zion, I will, I have begotten you. It wasn't just talking about Jesus. It was talking about when the church comes to Zion, you'll become my sons. And this day I'll say, these are my sons. Hear them. That's our heritage. That's why we're here. Oh, glory to God. I said to Jeremiah, before I formed you, before I sent you into the earth, I ordain that you be a prophet to the nations. God is saying to you, before you were sent into this earth, I determined that you would be sent in this generation. What a privilege. Prophets look forward to this day. What a privilege. You've been born into this world at this time, for such a time as this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says it will be said of this generation that these were born in Zion. It is written in the books, these people were born in Zion. You want your name in there? Hallelujah. It's written for a generation to come. I'm going to have to close, you know, but... We come into the kingdom for such a time as this. This revival is something that you have never seen before. I'm going to read to you a vision, then we're going to close. 1961, a man by the name of Tommy Hicks had a vision. Now I know the guy had problems. Don't judge, you don't know the background. It's amazing how somebody has a problem and the body of Christ takes it far around, further than what it ever was. It's sickening, you know. Anyway, he was a good man. He went down to Argentina. Within six weeks, a million people came to the Lord. That's the kind of ministry he had. Roman Catholic nation. He said, my message begins on July the 25th. At about 2.30 in the morning, I was in Canada, Winnipeg, Canada. I had hardly fallen asleep when the vision and the revelation of God gave me came before me. The vision came three times exactly the same in detail on the morning of July the 25th, 1961. I was so stirred, so moved by the revelation that this it changed my complete outlook on the body of Christ and upon the end time ministries. The greatest thing that the church has ever 
seen lies ahead of us. It's hard to help men and women realize and understand the thing that God is trying to give to his people in these end times. He said, I received a letter several weeks ago from one of our native evangelists in Africa, in Nairobi. This man and his wife were on their way to Tang Tanganyika and they, they could neither read nor write, but we had been supporting them for two years and they entered into the, a territory in Tanganyika and they came across a small village. The entire village was evacuating because a great plague had hit the village. He came across natives that were weeping. And he asks them, what was the matter? They told him that their mother and their father had suddenly died. And they had been there for three days. They couldn't go back into the house because of the plague. They were frightened of catching the plague. And uh, they have to leave. They were afraid to go in. They were leaving them in this little wooden cottage or hut. He turned to them and said, where are they? They pointed out to the hut and asked them to go with him. But they said, no, we, we're not going in there. The plague is clean, everyone. This native and his wife went to this little cottage and entered in where the man and woman had been dead for three days. He simply stretched forth his hand and said in the name of Jesus, spoke the man's name, the woman's name, and said, I command you in the name of Jesus to come back into your bodies. Three days dead, you know. Instantaneously, these two heathen people who had never known Jesus as their Savior sat up and immediately began to praise God. You remember this is back in the 60s. Instantaneously, this happened. He said, to us, it seemed a strange phenomenon. But that was the beginning of these end time ministries. God is going to take just anybody to do nothings and nobodies the unheard of. And he's going to anoint him to do great exploits in God. As it was in the books of, book of Acts in the last days. He said, as the vision appeared to me, I was asleep. I suddenly found myself in a great high distance where I was, uh, where I, was I do not know. But I was looking down upon the earth. Suddenly the whole earth came into view. Every nation, kindred, every tongue came before my sight from the east to the west, north to the south. I recognized every country and many cities that I had been in. And I was in fear and trembling as I began to, this great sight before me. And the whole world came into view. It began to lightning and thunder. As the lightning flashed over the face of the earth, my eyes went downward. I was facing north. And suddenly... I beheld what looked like a great giant. And as I stared and looked at it, I was almost bewildered. It was so gigantic, so great, his feet seemed to reach the North Pole and his head the South. His arms were stretched from sea to sea. I could not even begin to understand whether this be a mountain or be a giant. But as I watched, I suddenly beheld a great giant. I could see his head struggling for life. He wanted to live, but his body was covered from debris from head, head to foot. And at times, this giant would move his body and act as though he would even rise up. And when he did this, thousands of little creatures left the giant. Demons left the giant. The church. You know? And would run away. And when he would become calm again, they all returned. We've seen revival after revival after revival. We've seen this happen. And then the revival fades. It gets back to normal. This time it's going to be different. It's never going to end. Hallelujah. Never going to end. All of a sudden, this giant lifted his hand towards the heaven. And then it lifted its other hand. And when it did, these creatures by their thousands seemed to fly away from the giant and go into darkness. Slowly, this giant began to rise. And as he did, his head and his hands went into the clouds. As he rose to his feet, he seemed to have cleansed himself from the debris and the filth that was upon him. And he began to, began to raise his hands into the heavens as though he was praising the Lord. And as his hands went right up into the heavens and into the clouds. Suddenly, every cloud became silver. The most beautiful silver I had ever known. I watched this phenomenon. It was so great I could not even begin to understand what it meant. 
I was so stirred as I watched it and cried unto the Lord and said, Lord, what's the meaning of this? And I felt as though I was actually in spirit and could feel the presence of the Lord, even though I was asleep. And from those clouds, suddenly there came great drops of liquid light raining down upon the giant. And slowly, slowly, the giant began to melt. He began to sink into himself into the very earth itself. And as he melted, his whole form seemed to have melted upon the face of the earth. And the great rain began to continue down. Liquid drops of light began to flood the earth. And as I watched, this giant seemed to melt. And it suddenly became millions of people across the face of the earth. That's the end time army of the Lord. Millions of people. Some of you heard this. We need to hear it again. And as I began this sight, behold, I stood up. It stood up all over the world. People were lifting their hands and were praising the Lord. Then there came a great thunder that seemed to roar from the heavens. I turned my eyes towards the heavens, and suddenly I saw a figure in white, glistening white, the most glorious thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. I did not see the face, but somehow I knew it was the Lord Jesus. He stretched forth his hand, and as he did, he would stretch forth one to another, to another person, to another person. And as he stretched forth his hand upon the nations, the people of this world, men and women, as he pointed towards them, this liquid light seemed to flow from his hand into them. As a mighty anointing came upon these people in the earth. He said, I don't know how long I watched this. It seems it went into days, weeks, maybe months, I don't know. And I beheld Christ as he continued to stretch forth his hand. But people, there were some tragedies. There were people, as he stretched forth his hand, they refused the anointing and backed away. I saw men and women that I knew. People that I felt would certainly receive this and be open to it. But as, as he stretched forth his hand towards one another, they simply bowed their heads and backed away. Each of those that seemed to bow went down into darkness, backed into the darkness of the earth again. I was bewildered as I watched. But these people that had God had anointed, hundreds of thousands of people, Africa, England, Russia, China, America, all over the world, the anointing of God was upon these people. And they, they went forward in the name of the Lord. They were ditch diggers, they were washerwomen, they were rich, they were poor men. I saw people who were bound with paralysis and sickness, blindness and deafness. As the Lord stretched forth to give them this anointing, they became normal and healed and whole again. And this is the miracle of it all. This is the glorious miracle of all. As those people would stretch forth their hands exactly as the Lord did, and it seemed as if there was the same liquid light that filled them, passed into people they ministered to. And they said, according to my word, be thou made whole. As the people continued this mighty end time ministry, I did not fully realize what it was. I looked to the Lord and said, Lord, what is the meaning of this? He said, this is what I will do in the last days, in the final generation. I will restore everything. Everything the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm have eaten. I will destroy, I will restore everything they have destroyed. These people in the end times will go forth as a mighty army and sweep over the face of the earth. As I was at a great height, I could see the whole world under me. I watched these people as they were going forth over the whole earth. Suddenly there was a man in Africa, and in a moment he was transported by the Spirit to Russia or China or America. At times, whole groups of people, church, whole people, churches were transformed and sent across the world. All over the world, these people went. They came through the fire and through pestilence, through famine. Neither fire nor persecution seemed to stop them. Angry mobs came against them with guns and swords. And like Jesus, they just passed through the multitudes and could not, they could not find them. But they continued to go forth in the name of the Lord. The sick were healed. The blind eyes were opened. There was a not a long prayer at all. And after I viewed the vision many times in my mind, I thought about it many times, I realized something. I never actually saw any church. The church becomes the kingdom, the bride of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. 
It's a long thing. But as they marched forth, everything they did was an end time ministry. There were people, they were ministering to multitudes across the face of the earth. Millions were coming to the Lord. And it goes on. If you want it, you can go to our website and load the whole the whole vision down. He said there was a another clap of thunder and seemed it seemed to resound across the world. And I heard the voice that seemed to speak. Now this is my people. This is my beloved bride. And when the voice spoke, I looked up and I could see the lakes and the mountains and the graves were opened. People came out of graves all over the world. The saints of all ages seemed to be rising. And they rose from the grave. And suddenly all these people uh, from every direction, the east and the west and the south, they seemed to be forming into a gigantic body. As the dead in Christ seemed to be rising first, I could hardly comprehend it. It was beyond anything I could comprehend. This body became the bride of Christ. Then I watched her. And suddenly my eyes turned to the north and I saw seeming destruction. Men and women in anguish crying out, buildings being destroyed. I heard again a fourth voice that said, Now is my wrath being poured out on the face of the earth. From the ends of the world, the wrath of God seemed to be poured out. I could hear weeping and wailing. I could hear people crying. They, they ran into caves, but the caves in the mountains collapsed on them. They leaped into water, but they were drowned. So the vision came to me three times. This is what we're talking about. Are you up to this? This is what you want. Okay, we want revival, you know. But there's going to come some unveilings in our lives. But, but it's, it's okay. We're all in the same boat, you know. The seraphims are coming. We're going to open our hearts. The fire is going to come and cleanse. And then there's great anointing. Oh, and it shall be written, it says in the Psalms, these people were born in Zion. These people came to the fullness of Christ in Zion. It is written in the books, David said. Out of here is going to shine. And we're not talking years away. Over the next just few short years, one thing's going to unfold after the other. One year, the next year there'll be something new. The next year there'll be something. And they increase in the intensity. And the revival will increase in intensity and purity and cleansing as it goes. For such a time as this, we came into the kingdom of God. Such a time as this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. We won't be preaching long sermons then. You'll be spared. <laughs> and everywhere you go, you'll be like the Ark of the Covenant. If anyone touches you, tries to do evil against you, and people will learn not to touch these people, not to hurt them, not to harm them. These are the people of God. They come to heal, not to destroy. They come to save. We come to take these people and change their lives. God looked down from heaven. He heard the groanings of this generation. And his compassion welled up within him. And he said, I'm going to bring my people to Zion to save these people. And out of Zion shall come saviors. They shall become the light of the world. In a darkened world. This is our heritage. This is what we are destined for. This is why you are here. Don't, please don't judge what you don't understand. Just let it go. Wait. See. There'll be some strange things happening which we do not understand. You know? Remember? Closing with this. Remember the move that came out of those? It was a Canada Toronto. 
people were laughing, people were barking like dogs, and there was so much criticism. There was so much. And I said, God, what is this? This looks crazy, you know. This is, people were saying, you know, this is harming the church. This is denigrating the church. And anything we understand, we tend to judge. Don't understand, we tend to judge. I said, God, what is happening here? And I was watching this guy. He's, and he was barking like a dog. And he was a minister. And I thought, oh, man. It was on his hands and knees, barking. I said, God, what is this? He said, my shepherds have become like dumb dogs. They have stopped barking when the enemy comes. We don't understand unless you have revelation. What's going on? And we judge it. And we put ourselves back because we've judged it. What is coming? Be very careful. We have never seen anything like this before. Don't judge it. I mean, we need discerning of spirits to weed out the occult from the midst of it. That's, that's okay. But don't judge this. We don't understand it. Let it mature. Please. Don't disqualify yourself. You are not capable of judging. We are capable of discerning of spirits. But you are not capable of judging. We don't, no, we're not clever enough. We don't see how God sees, you know. I think, oh boy. And I watched this guy. He was. And I looked at this guy. He was whining. Everybody was laughing, and this guy was whining. I said, God, I have no clue what's going on. What is going on? The Lord came over to me and he touched me like this. And I saw two angels standing either side of this man, unwinding all of the things of his past, just like a cloth. And this guy was spinning around like this. And when they finished, he just fell on the floor and he was free. Don't judge that which you don't understand. Don't do it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, Charles Dickens, when he wrote The Tale of Two Cities, he opened it up by saying it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This is the best of times. And it was also the worst of times. And this is a tale of two kingdoms clashing. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's stand together. Oh, I'm sorry. I've taken so long. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Give us hearts to understand. Lord, we're standing on the brink of the precipice. Standing on a peak where there's watershed. We can see, like the children of Israel could see the promised land. But even though they could see it, they had the revelation of it. Most of them did not enter into it. I pray for this company of people here today. Lord, that each one of them may be found in that which is coming. Lord, Keep them. Help them. Cause them, Lord, to position themselves to be a part of what is coming. What has started. Cause them, Lord, to continue to press into you and seek you, to ask, to seek, to knock, to press in, to desire what is coming. To desire a fresh cleansing in our hearts, a fresh unveiling of ourselves. It's a process of walking up the steps desire that the glory of the Lord might be seen upon us, that we come with clean hands and a pure heart, and that out of this Zion, ourselves, may God shine. And the world will know Jesus is real. Father, we thank you. 
thank you for your grace that's going to be poured out to enable us to move into this. We need your grace. We need supernatural ability to move into this. We need understanding and revelation. Keep us from falling off the side. Keep us straight, Lord. We have a propensity to get off track so easy. Keep us on the center of the track. We ask you to keep us centered, Lord. That we be found, Lord, in, in your day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We need your grace. We need your grace. We need your grace. We need your grace. Can we sing Amazing Grace? Thank uh -huh. we'll key that in. I usually start at too high, so. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I was blind. But now I see. Twas grace, twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears relieved. How that grace I feel. 